Why don't we go ahead and we'll get started now. I think we'll probably have a few more people coming online and in here. Um, the forum committee has been talking about and just kind of off to the side a burial, burial options for some time. And somehow, I don't even know how it, it came about, the book, The Green Burial Guidebook came to my attention by Elizabeth Fournier. And I said, oh, cool. So I got it and read through it. Said, man, this is pretty exciting. I said, well, I'm gonna take a gamble. I'm just gonna email her and see if she'd wanna come and speak with us. And she was graceful and grateful for, uh, for coming and joining us this morning. Um, uh, we'll let her give her story a little bit and she'll show her slides and talk to us. So Elizabeth, welcome. Hi there, how are you? Um, glad to see your faces all there. <laughs> uh, my microphone is a little bit loud. I'm coming in hot. I have a new road set up here and it uh, really everything. I had to take the battery out of the clock. I have to make sure I don't squish around on my desk. It just picks up everything. So if you hear a lot of, you know, my stomach gurgling and all that, it's, it's just me. Everything is fine over here. So thank you, George. And thank you to all of you for having me in. And I'm thrilled to be able to talk to people about Oh, gosh. Um, end of life stuff. It's a conversation that isn't always comfortable. We don't always have. And I make a point to be very reverent and respectful about it. So don't worry about any of the conversation being too abrasive or any of the pictures being anything too morbid. I am a very uh, soft approach sort of gal. And I, I think I come with more of a kind of a, a motherly energy. So um, I guess we can just kind of get started and go. And what I really want to do is show you what green burial, what natural options look like. I want to give you a little bit of an idea of why I'm here and why I do this work, um, how we got here with the history of the United States and through what we've done in the past through the funeral industry and now why green is sort of exploding off the map. And this is really in the zeitgeist of media and all these things. So I'm going to go ahead and just quickly um, stop my video so you don't have to stare at me talking. You can look at my sumptuous photos. And then at the end, I really want to hear all your questions um, because that is really, you know, why you're here. I think there might be something on your mind and definitely want to hear it. So if you take a look here, this is, this happens to be a cemetery in Texas. And um, every state in the U.S. has at least one cemetery, some have plenty more, where you can have a natural burial. And a natural burial is a body in a natural state, and it's placed in a natural biodegradable container, and it's placed in a natural grave. And a natural grave means there isn't any sort of a concrete liner there at the bottom, or steel or polypropylene, or no sort of grave box or concrete liner, anything like that that's going to go around the casket or the alternative container, we're going to have a body in something that's going to break down in a space not so deep and you're going to become part of the earth and give back your greatness. So I think if you're your spirit and soul, you've already ascended to better places, then we have our physical vehicle that we were so fortunate to have here on the planet and why not let that nourish the earth. So really saving the planet one death at a time is truly, it's what the world really needs now. It's that idea of reducing our carbon footprint and going out in sort of an eco-friendly style. And that's a neat thing about it. You can be as simple as a cardboard box. You can be fabulous like here with wicker and all the sunflowers or really sort of whatever works for you. All right. So green burial is a way of caring for our dead with the least possible environmental impact. And that's a really important piece of this. We want to have body preparations and burial practices that really allow the body to decompose, to go back to earth, to be natural. And we want this to happen in some sort of a site where it's meant to be environmentally friendly and it's a sound resting space where other bodies necessarily don't have chemicals. And it's a place where we can be um, having that end goal where nothing is used that doesn't help replenish the soil, which is really, really what's happening now and really, really fantastic. So I was blessed with my love of green burial about 18 years ago. Um, I have been in the death field since um, 1990. 
So that's 33 years. And I've had a variance of jobs, but I've been out here at this little goat barn here. I work out of a repurposed goat barn in Boring, Oregon. I am the undertaker out here. I'm a licensed funeral director. And um, when I first came out here out in the country, this really lovely, gentle group of people asked me to meet them at a local pub because they wanted to discuss their recently deceased friend. They wanted her to stay in here where they lived, they had this intentional community. They owned a lot of land and they wanted to have her stay there and they didn't wanted to have her placed there and buried there. And I had to explain to them pretty forwardly, I've only worked throughout my career either at funeral homes that were you know, relatively traditional or I've worked for the Catholic diocese. And I was intrigued and thrilled, but I had to say, you know, I've never done this before. Um, I want to figure out how we can do this. Let's work together and let's make it happen. So um, we met, we talked about Wanda the Wanderer. And yeah, they said she just really wants to have her eternal rest there on private land. And they want to be in this intentional community. And it's, um, it's where they lived. And I was really thrilled to say that it happened. The next day I uh, called the the county. And that's what I find when people want to have a home burial, which I realize isn't really a big thing in Washington. Washington state rules read that unless you actually own your own island, burial on your own property isn't significant. Here in Oregon, most of the counties, and there's a lot of states that say, sure, go ahead. So I'm just going to touch on home burial a little bit, but I just want to make sure you knew this is how I got into what I'm doing here. It was such an easy process and it was so fulfilling. Um, the county said, sure, I don't see why not. The owner of the property said, yes, it's a go. We had a backhoe come. We were able to dig a small grave space, not very deep down because you want a body not to go so down when you're having a natural burial. And the ceremony was really lovely. It was really what I think Wanda would have had if she was alive. They were playing some drums and speaking of her kindness and her um, young sons were able to lower her gently into her grave space. And she had this little tiny frame. Can I stop yes. you just one second? We're having a little trouble hearing you over our system. And oh, okay. Um, and I've tried turning the volume up a little bit. Maybe um, if you could be a little closer, if it's possible. I don't know how close you're yeah. going to be. Is this better and, here? And then maybe just a little bit slower. Sure. Is this better? Why don't you just talk for a little bit and we'll let them hear in the back here. Okay. Let me know if this is better at all. Can you? Are you able to hear me with this? Okay. Let's try this. Let's keep going. Okay. Are you hearing me okay now? Yes. That was this is better, better now. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Maybe that okay. More volume would be good. Oh, great. Okay. I just went ahead and I um. And I just, I unplugged, yeah, I unplugged my mic. I'm doing it a different way now. Good, thank you for letting me know. I think that's important. I would have hated for a whole hour to go by and people to say, gosh, okay, didn't understand a thing. <laughs> so definitely speak, I will uh, <laughs> make it happen here. So we were able to bury the loved one here on her local property. It was uh, a lovely, lovely day. And I decided right away as I drove home, wow, you know, I always thought the reason I was called to work in death and dying is because as a young child in my family home, half of my family died in a pretty sudden time. The grandparents who live with us, my mother, and as a small child, I knew my childhood looked different than other people. I was going to Catholic school and the priest was always at our house. The priest was always announcing um, the Fournier family is, you know, having a mass for somebody and we're always having a funeral and a burial and a rosary. So I thought, well, that's why obviously I grew up to work in this field. But as time went on and I was able to help families do this in their yard and see the difference it made for families to be able to do this methodically and lovingly and take their time, I thought, huh, this is a real watershed moment for me. This idea of maybe this is the deeper meaning of why I'm called to this land and called to this earth. So glad I could do that. Um, I just have a bunch of photos. Whenever I speak to somebody, I ask what they want to hear about, and then I put some things together. When a grave, this was actually Wanda here that we were just talking and sharing the story about. 
But when a grave is filled up and it's a natural grave, this is what we have. We have some, we have a knoll of earth and we make it a little bit rounder because it's going to compensate for it lowering a little bit into the ground. And um, the native foliage is a really important piece of all this because ultimately we don't want to add anything to the ground that wasn't there. Putting the soil back in the layers, um, maybe again, not planting something that's non-native. You know, we want to carpool all of those fantastic things and really do the best we can here. All right, so up until about 150 years ago, that's what we did. We buried people on their own private property or we buried them at the local cemetery, the churchyard, those sort of things. We had small community places where our loved ones would be. And that would be a place where we knew the souls of the dearly departed were. Um, home funerals were really everywhere. This is a family who had someone pass. They just create some sort of a container. The women come, they lay out the dead, they wash, they bathe. The men are responsible for preparing the space, preparing the casket. And the process really from start to finish really brought the family and the community together. And it really made death this amazingly, amazing intimate experience. Visitations were often held in the front parlor of the house. A lot of homes had a very large grand room downstairs, and a lot of that was for gathering, but a lot of that was also the foresight that that was the original funeral parlor. We would have somebody um, in their container, they'd be bathed, they'd be groomed, they'd be dressed, and people could come into the house, they could share food, they could spend time, and it wasn't rushed where you need to come to your local funeral home for one hour and sit and visit. You could actually have that person in the comfort of their own home and take your time to say goodbye and have them slowly be able to leave the family and um, when people were ready, there was a door that was large enough that a casket could go out. It would be loaded into some sort of a buggy like this and then transported off to the down the street to wherever it needed to be for its burial. So this is what we did up until about the Civil War. Back in um, 18, you know, the early 1860s, we had a lot of soldiers' bodies that were deceased and families really wanted them to come home. They wanted to have their home service. They wanted to bury them at home or in the churchyard or down the street. So to get the boys home, we needed to put them on trains and there wasn't any sort of refrigeration. So the transportation of the deceased was really problematic. In order to slow the decomposition and the different cruelties of war and things that were happening, there were some doctors in the field and they came up with this elixir of this arsenic and mercury and soap and water and it allowed them to preserve the bodies until they could be transported back to their families. So back when 1960, excuse me, 1865 came and our beloved president Abraham Lincoln died, that was a very big deal in our country. And it was decided that he would be embalmed and he would be put on this train. This is his funeral train. And he would be carried through 1600 miles through 180 cities in seven different states. And there would be a dozen or so cities where his casket would lower from the train and would go into this presidential hearse. So if you look to the left, you see that fancy coach and that would come from the train He's there and he would go to wherever he was going to be put and handed off to to stay. And I guess what you'd say is lay in state so the morning crowds could pay their respects. Um, you can see people, if you look to the right, all the people in the windows there of that building. You can only imagine how many floors that building had and all the people who had to see this happening. He was really beloved. And a neat thing is his son had died three years earlier. His son, Willie, had died of typhoid fever, his body was exhumed and embalmed. So the three, the two of them actually traveled together. And on the train, of course, they had to keep reapplying these chemicals. But nonetheless, this idea and this extended publicity really put embalming on the center stage. And that really was what made the death care industry be born. Um, 
So from there, we had funeral homes, we had cemeteries that had people be buried with the fancy metal caskets and the fancy tombstones and the embalming and all that. So what I have here is a list of cemeteries currently in the state of Washington that say you don't have to come with your fancy casket and your fancy preservation and your headstone. We will allow you to be buried natural in your shroud or the sheet from your bed or from a wicker basket. And so if you take a look, these are all over the state. We have a couple here closer to the southern border. Um, probably for you all there, Bainbridge Island, Whidbey Island, then we have some over Spokane over in the eastern area. But more cemeteries, more and more starting to say, sure, yeah, you don't have to buy a grave liner. So if somebody says, you know, I would like to go to a cemetery and I would like to do something really simple and I really don't want to have all the fancy things that need to happen, the bells and whistles, I guess, as they say. What you can do is call your local pioneer cemetery or your local historical cemetery or tiny little church cemetery and just merely say, can someone be buried there without a grave liner or a grave box? And that means you can have a natural burial. If you call places and say, can I have a green burial? They might not know what you're talking about. So ultimately, if there doesn't need to be something in the grave, which is metal or concrete, you can have your natural burial. Um, this this um, slide here, I also have on my website, cornerstonefuneral.com. Even though I'm in Oregon, I have all of the US states and provinces in Canada that will allow natural burial. The list updates all the time. And on there, if you go to the green burial grounds, there is a pullout page on the front, which has all the Pacific Northwest burial grounds of Oregon and Washington, just to make that a little bit easier for people. So there's cemeteries all over. This is Meadow Natural Burial Ground in Ferndale, Washington, really close to the Canadian border. You can tell here there's a walking path. There is some natural meadow. Um, we have uh, these stones, these uh, flagstones marking graves. And this looks like a, a nice walk in the park, doesn't it? This is really what a natural green cemetery looks like. This is Sunnyside Cemetery in Whidbey Island. Now this is a hybrid cemetery, which means there are standard graves, but throughout the cemetery, you also can have a natural burial where you don't necessarily have to have a large tombstone. You don't have to take care of the resources and all these things that wouldn't be necessarily um, useful. A lot of people say, well, you know, I don't want to have all this concrete and steel in the ground or all this hardwood or all these chemicals because people aren't using them for resources. Um, and what we found is how it works in America is the amount of steel, for instance, and concrete and things we use, we could replace the Golden Gate Bridge annually. I mean, that's a pretty big deal to think about that. We could build one annually with all of the resources that go in the ground when somebody dies. We could have a one lane highway from here to Kansas annually, from the West Coast to Kansas annually, one lane could go just with the resources that go in the ground. So it's a lot to think about, all the Olympic-sized swimming pools with embalming fluid, all of those things that could happen. So it's, it's just, if you are eco-minded and want to make an eco-choice, you know, it does good things for the planet. If this isn't your cup of tea and your family has always done something a little bit more traditional, then fabulous. Um, I am as a funeral director, my job is to be ethical and to present all options to people. Even though I prefer the green options, again, I don't push my agenda. I just say, hey, did you know these are some options of things that you can have? This is Herland Forest. This is in, in Wakayakis, Washington. This is down further south from you all in Klickitat County. So almost the Washington side of the Columbia River Gorge. And this is a natural cemetery. And the stewards actually live on the 40 acres in the cemetery. And when a family will leave after a burial, they do lovely things like this, where they can lay down cedar boughs and they can, they spelled out love with the um, pine cones and the, some of the flowers the family brought, they laid them there on the earth in the back and they, they circled with some rocks. And I just find this so lovely. It's such a lovely tribute to the person who passed away. And I think lovely for families to receive this picture the next day to say, don't you worry, your loved one is taken care of. We're watching over them. And we took the time to 
uh, really celebrate their burial. I just think this is a very special place and I really, really love this. So I'm gonna quickly just kind of go through it's a little bit of what backyard burial looks like, because this again, isn't something necessarily that you can do in your state unless you own an island, which really isn't so ostentatious because many people, there's so many islands in Washington. Um, families sometimes have land, they can go ahead and they dig a space and that's sort of what that looks like there. A backhoe can come, can do its thing. Some people have smaller kabotos you can dig by hand, but this is sort of the true facts in real life of how this happens. So happy to show the pictures because sometimes people say, well, what does that look like when you have a burial in your yard? Because all they can imagine is green, sparkling grass of a cemetery, and uh, it doesn't make sense. So just want to kind of entertain you a little bit with some of these photos here. So in many states across the U.S., you can do lots of things yourself. In the state of Washington, in the state of Oregon, you can act as your own funeral director. And what that means is you do not have to hire a funeral home. You can transport your own loved one. You can get a doctor to sign a death certificate. You can provide your own cooling. Um, you can drive your person to a crematory or to a cemetery. You can bathe your own loved one. There's all these options and all these things. So if there's any interest that anybody has who says, yeah, you know, my, you know, grandpa always said he'd love his last ride in the, in the family truck or the pickup truck, or someone says, yeah, you know, um, she would love it if we built something out of, um, bamboo leaves or something, some sort of a container. Or if you look right here, this is just a blanket from a bed, just a natural fabric blanket. Um, you know, you can do these things. These things are fully legal to you and it's something that can happen. So when someone transports somebody, we just say a station wagon or a minivan or a truck bed with a canopy, any of this is fine. We just want to be respectful and reverent to the body. And you notice here there's a wood tray because moving somebody, it makes it much easier to have a rigid container underneath somebody than have sort of a floppy bundle of a blanket. This is a family who I was helping and they just happened to put this on top of the truck and they thought they were hilarious. And I thought that was just really sweet and really touching. And I really loved it. I thought that was really neat. So people can get creative sometimes with all of the things they want to do. So biodegradable caskets aren't just simple pine boxes. Um, they can be cardboard. That is pretty fantastic. Think about how low cost that is and how simple that is. Wool is a very eco-friendly material. So is silk, um, so is linen, all these things. Wicker, over to the right, wicker and seagrass, um, bamboo. Those are all very eco-friendly containers. Newspaper, There's um, that's a decoupage over there. That's called an ecopod. And that's just something someone was put together, kind of a paper mache, and they didn't use toxic glue. And they have some flour and some water, and then it's painted with non-toxic paint. And these were made in England, and now someone in Oregon makes these, but that's a pretty fantastic thing. Um, in, the, in the middle here too, there is a shroud and then a pine casket with handles. You notice all of these things have straps or handles or something, because we have to be able to transport it either from the home or the funeral home. We need to get it in some sort of a vehicle. We need to get it into a burial space. And funeral homes now are fine with you deciding, oh, I found this kit online that I want to put together, or, oh, I have this thing. And, you know, as long as it's willing, you're willing to work with them and to share what you want to do. And if you're interested in doing something alternative, you call a funeral home and they say, oh, no, no, we don't do that, or that's not legal or something, then call another funeral home. That's a nice thing about coming to a presentation like this, because you can hear more information. You can also realize this is a good time to do some planning, have a conversation with those who you might be taking care of or might be taking care of you, and then maybe make some calls to figure out if you do want a funeral home to help you, who will that be? And will they honor things that you want to do and maybe find out about their green options? Because there's a lot of them and we'll, we'll get to those here shortly. This is Burlap Sacks, and this is a cemetery here in Oregon. Um, you notice the green, beautiful grass, but we have the setup for a natural burial, and that's because it's a hybrid cemetery where they honor 
traditional burials, modern burials, whatever you want to do. This was a lovely Quaker fella. And he had me out to his house and said, honey, let me show you something. And he took me out to the garage and he showed me these wonderful burlap sacks. And he said, my kids inside think I'm crazy, but I want to be wrapped in these shroud, these, these sacks. Can you do that for me? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, let's go back inside and let's have a conversation with your children because you can tell me what you want, but they're going to be in charge of you. So let's go inside. And originally there was some pushback and they said, oh gosh, we don't want to do that because it makes us look cheap. It makes us look like we just dug something out of the garage. So finally they realized why dad wanted to do this why it's perfectly fine dad wanted to do this. And then when the day came and there he is in the sunshine, they were so tickled by, by it and was explaining to everybody, this is what he wanted. And everybody thought it was pretty neat. So it worked out really well. So having the conversations is very important. And if the person who is legally in charge of you, meaning how we work this out in the, in the United States here is either your spouse, or your registered domestic partner. And then we go to adult child. After that, we talk about adult parent. And then we talk, well, I guess a parent would be an adult. And then we talk about a sibling. After that point, then it really could be cousin, aunt, um, you know, you know, grandparent, grandchild, whatever. But whoever is legally in the next of line to take care of you, if that person isn't into your ideas or thinks, oh gosh, no, that idea of a pine box, oh, that's terrible, then you might want to consider either going into a funeral home and paying for things and getting things set up or getting somebody else to put in the position to take care of you so your wishes can be carried out. Something important to think about. This is the top this fellow has that kit that I was talking about. You can get these kits online and they're pine. Um, there's something you can just put together or they're a natural um, white wood. You can place these together with non-toxic glue, non-metal. There might be some original screws to get something together, but then a dowel will put it together. Down below is a more what we call a coffin because it's more a hexagon there and hexagonal and um, somebody had come and they decided to paint it. And that's a really neat way to get grandchildren involved. They can come paint and draw and do things and using some non-toxic markers, of course is preferable, but you know, we try the best we can. Um, no one is ever 100% fully green because you're probably not going to be carpooling to the cemetery. People will be wearing leather shoes. Somebody probably will have their single use Starbucks cup in their hand. So we try to be green. We try to say, hey, here are some methods and here's some things. But you know, if someone's going to mark on the casket, it's not going to be, they're going to be regular Crayola markers. So be it. That's fine. We're moving in the right direction. That's great. I have a lot of families who deliver caskets here to the funeral home. And this is what this looks like. It's just, we've got some tie downs. We have some uh, wrapping for this. There's a comforter. There looks like it's a pad off a lawn chair. People just do the best they can and they bring something over and that's fantastic. Here it comes. We can get it into the funeral home. Funeral homes cannot charge you for providing your own casket. Keep that in mind. As long as it can fit into the grave space, as long as it has handles, you're fine. And probably fitting through the door of the funeral home is important too, but you probably wouldn't have problems with that. <sighs> this picture always makes me laugh. I had a young fellow who was bringing this for his sibling and this is what he did. He, uh, you know, we talked about how are you getting the casket to me? Do you need me to come in my van? How can we help? And he said, no lady, I got it taken care of. So he's got a scrap of cardboard. <laughs> and this was really daring. I sort of, I blurred out the license plate a little bit there, but you know, he's in his legal rights. He's fine, but I can only imagine the looks of people while he's driving down the country road to come to me. That was uh, pretty daring. And we had a good laugh out of it. And I said, were you nervous at all? He said the whole way. So, you know, we can always do something a little bit more functional, but you know, he made it happen. So I, I didn't want to shame him at all. I said, that's, you really did great. That's uh, you know, it's really honorable. He made it happen. So back in December, 2020, I was fortunate to be a part of the first natural organic reduction. And this was at Herland Forest, which is in Wakayakas, Washington, down in Klickitat County. This is something that you might hear about. It's called human composting. And it's also natural organic reduction. Um, there is a, if you look at the top left there, that is a vessel. The vessel can rock back and forth. Um, 
you know, that's me on the left. And I think I would have rethought those socks if I knew that these pictures would be used nationwide. So much media. Yes, you know, I'm in the forest. What do I care? But yeah, there's isn't a very flattering sweater either. But that's a, as a woman, we think about these things, unfortunately. So in the middle there, that is a cradle which has wood chips in it. There's half filled with wood chips. We lay the loved one in, the deceased loved one in, and then we add the re remainder of the remainder of that material. And that's what's needed to balance out that carbon to nitrogen ratio. Sometimes there's woodland flowers. Um, sometimes wood chips, alfalfa, just sort of whatever it is. And rather than that, rely on that bacteria, which is naturally found within a person's digestive system, we could enhance the reduction process by adding a mix of things like um, protozoa and fungi and bacteria. And the real key requirement here for the natural organic reduction is it needs to reach a temperature of about 131 degrees and hold that for a few days. You can see there in the bottom right, we're putting the lid back on the cradle. The, the gentleman there to the right, that's Walt Patrick. He owns that burial forest. He's a really interesting fellow. Um, you might want to consider having him talk at some point. He, uh, he's, a, he's a Mensa person. He's brilliant and he's just really interesting and a great conversationalist and storyteller. So we put the lid back on and then it can rock. And then in about four months, you have compost, which is wonderful. You have compost that you can go ahead and put in your garden. You can donate it to the forest, do what you want. Currently, there are six states which allow natural organic reduction. There are only two states that have facilities up and running. And aren't you fortunate, Washington, you have four facilities up and running, which is really neat. There are three around the Seattle area. They are indoors. They're called Earth and Recompose and Return Home. They do this inside. And this cemetery down a little bit closer to the Portland area does this outside. Um, so if you have any interest, you can look up natural organic reduction, Washington State, the facilities will come up. You can take a look at what they have to offer. And um, this is for people who decide I love gardening. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I would love my person to be turned into soil and compost and it can be in the forest and they can have a tree which is natural to the area and their honor. And that just seems like the right thing for a lot of people. So pretty neat. Burial at sea. So this is something, this is also a very green method. It's legal in all 50 states, but we know we want to keep the carbon footprint low. If you live in Nebraska or Kansas, if you really want to have a burial at sea, we've got to get you to an ocean. So not the greenest choice, but if you are people like you all who live near water, this can happen. A whole body can be released into the ocean and it sinks and it decomposes naturally. Uh, burial C is very green. You don't have to be a uh, Kennedy or be in the military. This is something offered to everyone. And ultimately, um, you're three miles off the coast at an ocean depth of about 600 feet. There is a person on the boat, a sea captain, who knows what they're doing. There's companies all over the place that will do this, and a licensed funeral director does need to be there. Here's a ceremony, and then that bag is weighted. And it will go down to the seafloor and the person will join the ocean floor and give back to sea life. And I guess if somebody was a diver or a, uh, a yachtist, I guess, or a sailor or something, this might be really their choice. It might be exciting for them. And others say, oh, my gosh, no way. That just seems too out there. But it's definitely an option, something available to you. Again, you can look at you know, burial at sea. It doesn't have to be just ashes. You can have a full body available to you. This is aqua dissolution. You might have heard of green cremation, bio cremation, water cremation. This is what that is. So we're using water to bring the body back to a natural state. Rather than the high heat of the flame cremation, this is alkaline hydrolysis. It is environmentally friendly because it accelerates the natural decomposition and breaks down the remains to ultimately have ashes. That's what the output is. You will have an urn full of ashes that you can do what you want. It's a greener approach because it reduces fossil fuels and it doesn't release any of the harmful gases or chemicals that contributes to air pollution. Also, if the 
um, crematory missed the fact you have a pacemaker. Well, there's that lithium battery that's going to blow up, and that's pretty. That's a that's a pretty big deal out in the world. That's a lot of bad energy out there. Um, we want to make sure that doesn't happen. All the mercury in your teeth goes out and pollutes, and then ashes themselves sort of float around in the universe. And when it rains, comes on down to the earth, and it gets on the farmlands and gets everywhere and the, the fish eat it and the chicken eat it. And then we just have this sort of ashy pollutant sort of cycle of life. So even though it's a real trick because standard flame cremation is about 80% in California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. It's a very, very popular choice. It's also probably the least expensive choice. Um, unless of course you can bury somebody in your yard, you can keep them at home once they die. You're not dealing with transportation. You're not dealing with dying a grave. You probably need to provide some pizza for the guys digging the space. But really this is probably your the least expensive method is the flame cremation. Water cremation tends to be a little bit more expensive. In the state of Washington, you do have one aqua cremation place. It's in Kent, Washington. And you would need to hire a funeral home to be able to access that just because they are a mortuary services and they provide services that way. But again, another idea that's green, something you can do, something people don't always realize is out there. And then even though people read about things or hear about things, they don't always know that they're legal and people don't always know it's available for you. You can make the choice. It's not just a specific sort of person. One really neat thing with this is everything becomes really purified. So if you have a titanium replacement or a pacemaker, everything neutralizes, and then you get this really shiny piece of metal back, which is nice. It's really nice if you want that for any reason, um, just to kind of show you how gentle the process is. Pretty neat stuff. This is uh, just a seagrass ba basket here with some flowers. So I'm just kind of wrapping up here. Just want to show you a little bit more and then I want to hear about whatever questions you have. But this interest in green burial, it's really reaching across the country. And it's because it's right there in the name, green burial, green burial options, the idea of doing something with water or doing something with compost or having this done with a a burial someplace. And there's going to be more options as time goes on too. There was a freeze drying option that was really popular in Sweden. Um, the person got a little bit older, the patent went away, and now they decided they're not really working with that process anymore. So that might get picked up by somebody down the road. People occasionally see these things called eco pods and people will call me and say, I want to be in that pod and I want to be buried in an eco pod forest. And then I have to tell people, gosh, I'm sorry, that's something which has been created in Italy. It's called Capsula Mundi. It is not a legal form of disposition yet, but it is something that, you know, possibly will come at one day. Um, but, you know, there's different things. People are creating new things and coming up with new things all the time. So it's a really interesting process of what's happening out here in the world. Green, it's just really in that zeitgeist and it's legal in all 50 states. It's not necessarily legal in all states to bury on private property, but there are plenty of cemeteries that will welcome you and allow you to be there. So it's pretty fantastic that way. Uh, another way to green up your experience, even if your family decides, nope, we're going the traditional path. Like I said before, you can carpool. You can decide that you are going to have plants rather than cut flowers. Maybe you're going to decorate the grave or the funeral or the visitation or the church, maybe even with succulents, something then you can give to the family to take home with them because cut flowers will ultimately die in a very quick period of time. But that's a nice thing to give plants that people can plant in their garden or keep on their table. It's a nice idea. Also, there's recycled paper that can be used for memorial folders. You can get together and decide that you're going to have sustainable farm food for your morning meals. There's all types of shades of green, which I think is really important because sometimes people think, oh, but you know, she really wants this blue metal casket. And even though we're going to a place that says natural burial can happen and we're not going to embalm her, she still wants this blue metal casket. And I'll say, well, you know, you didn't choose embalming. You maybe you're doing some other things. Again, shades of green. Be kind to yourself. We're trying to figure it out as we go. A really important thing to happen here. 
And these are just some different ways that people have natural burials um, from a shroud to a box. Uh, I noticed that when people are doing this in a more natural way at a place, people tend to hang out and take more time. People tend to lower the casket themselves. They tend to spend a little bit more time decorating with flowers or talking about the person and maybe even sitting on the earth and hanging out afterwards or using handfuls or shovelfuls of soil to replace back in the grave space. Um, a lot of really interesting things people are coming up with and people are finding ways to save the green of the planet, save the green of their wallet. And there's lots of options to make that happen. This is my book that George was talking about. And if you have an interest, go to your local library. Don't get a tree cut down to buy it. You can either get it electronically on your fire stick or your iPod, or I, I, you can tell I don't read books online. I don't quite know what those handheld devices are that you read a book on, but you can also go to your library and if they don't have it, they can get it there for you. And that's a really nice way to go ahead and check things out. So I'm going to get rid of that. Put me back on here. Hello, there I am. And I just want to open up for any questions at this point. Do you have any uh, idea of what the cost of the composting uh, option is relative to, say, uh, cremation? Yes. So a standard flame cremation across the board, because funeral homes can choose whatever cost they want, it's going to be somewhere between, I'm going to say, $700 up to $3,000. All depends. Every funeral home can choose their own price point, what they want to do. Um, again, shopping around, getting a feeling what's right for you. If you've got time, that way you end up not in a panic, maybe spending the $3,000 for the cremation when you can do it for the $700. The composting is in a couple different increments. The least expensive is Herland Forest in Wakaikis, Washington. It's outside. They charge $3,000 for the whole process. Um, I believe Earth and also Return Home are closer to the $5,000 mark, and then Recompose is about the $7,000 mark. Also keep in mind that some of those places have a funeral director, meaning they can take care of a death certificate, transportation, all that for you. Other places, you might have to actually work with a funeral home too to get you there, so that might be an added expense. Sharon and I just signed up at Earth Funeral, and it's $5,400, and that includes a $500 insurance policy, which will bring you back from anywhere in the world. So they happen to have had somebody that was working a job in Iran, and they do all the paperwork um, to bring the person back. So as part of the, you could choose to have that policy. So if you uh, were to pass away more than 75 miles away from your home, um, it, they would use this insurance fund to bring you back. Yeah, and some people travel more than others. Um, some stick pretty close to home. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of choices out there. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Ask the questions and you know, you'll listen and hear the answers. Has a, has a forest somewhere? Yeah, both of them do. Recompose has a forest in southwest Washington. It's a land conservation that takes up about 700 acre <laughs> property. Um, Earth Funeral Zeus is over in the Olympics. They have about a five acre plot right now. So, and it looks up at the Olympic Mountains, right? Uh, just a little bit north of Quilcene off of 101, as it, right before it hits the uh, 104, I think it is, coming off the uh, Hood Canal Bridge. And those are good questions to ask because you might say, okay, I don't want to take drums of the compost home. What do you do with it? And if that company drives 100, 200 miles away to do something with it, again, carbon footprint, you might want to think about that. If somebody does something locally, again, depends on what your interest is. It depends on the shade of green that you want, but great questions to ask. And that's great you have that information, George.
Okay, George alluded to this, bringing a body from Iran back. How does that timing work? How do you preserve the body long enough to get back? Well, in that case, since it's international, we would need to have embalming. And so that would need to happen to take care of, require things, um, you know, they have their rules, their regulations, get somebody on an airplane, the preservation, and the paperwork takes so long. Same thing as if we're going to ship someone out of country, it takes about three to maybe five weeks for the consulate, for the translation of the documents, for the apostasies, for everything at the state. It's quite a process, and so embalming tends to happen. Um, one way you can do something, for instance, there are people who do fly into the state of Washington because they do want to have the natural organic reduction and it's not in their state. It's also not close enough. You do not necessarily have to be embalmed to be on an airplane. There's a lot of air carriers um, such as Southwest Air that says as long as you use gel packs or something, um, you can make that happen. So the body can stay preserved enough and it can happen that way. Again, you're using the fossil fuel of the airplane. So how green are you if you're flying from Maine to Washington to have your natural organic reduction? So again, if you know if the if the idea of the composting is what you want, then you have the give and take if in, in someone's mind, if they say that's okay, then fantastic. There's just all the options. There's all the choices and people and families truly choose what's best for them, but it can be done. But yes, for my Ron, we're probably looking at an embalmed person. Uh, it would be unusual for a person to pass away, let's say in a hospital. So what would be the um, issues that a person would face if you wanted to do, say a room burial or you wanted to pick up the body yourself? and you know, put it in a, some form of uh, you know, disposable uh, container and, and have it buried, uh, what, what might be the problems or challenges with the hospital? So that's a fantastic question because I don't believe most hospitals or most nursing homes have families come. They're used to either the medical examiner showing up or they're used to a funeral home showing up. So what I recommend is have the conversation. If your loved one is in the hospital and you think it's going to be eminent, talk with the nursing supervisor and say, this is what we want to do. We know this is legal. Some states it's not, but you live in a joyously wonderful state that allows a lot of these things to happen. And you can say, I understand this is legal. This is something we want to do. Now there's the physicality of the transport. They can have you go to the loading dock. They can get you to where you need to go, but you have to physically get the body to your vehicle. If someone is very lightweight, you possibly can have a piece of a board or some sort of stretcher and people can carry, but most times than not, that's not going to be the case. Someone is going to be heavier. If you don't have a gurney, you don't have a cart, you don't have something like that, the hospital probably isn't going to say here, or they might. If you call ahead of time and you're very nice, they have ways of transporting people from the room they pass away down to their holding facility. So maybe they'd be nice enough to help you and wheel out to your vehicle. Or maybe you could ask a local funeral home, can we rent your gurney? Again, those are just some things we need to think about. And um, sometimes people say, okay, we wanna drive our person, we wanna do this, but we're getting a lot of pushback from the hospital. I'm tired, I'm grieving. Um, we're not getting where we want to be. We can't change hospitals at this point. Our loved one has passed away. It is what it is. And then maybe just have the funeral home get the person and bring them to your home or know the funeral home is just going to hold them. And then you can get them and you can transport them yourself to the cemetery, all of that. There also is a timing issue. And in the state of Washington, there needs to be a permit for burial. So doing something within 24 hours sometimes is a bit tricky. Because, for instance, in Oregon, we just need to know some medical person is signing, a nurse practitioner, hospice director, someone in the hospital will sign the death certificate, we can mark it down on a piece of paper, and done. We have the permit, we can bury right this minute. With Washington, it's on an electronic system, and what happens is the doctor, whomever, has to sign it, and then it has to be validated through the county where the death was. And then 
you can go ahead and do it. So that takes a little bit longer. So in the state of Washington, it's a little trickier just to have this hand delivered piece of paper and say, here, doctor, sign this. If you're interested in doing most things yourself, I would highly suggest that you hire a funeral home just to pay the minimal amount for them just to do the paperwork. And what I've told families in Oregon, Washington, wherever, because I can, I'm on the Washington electronic system, $100, I will get the vital statistics, I will type your death certificate, I'll pay your state filing fee, I'll order your death certificates, and I'll also stay on top of the nurses in the county and hopefully get this pushed through in half a day for you. So that's a little bit different. Doing it yourself as far as the paperwork in Washington is trickier. I don't want to put a barrier up and say it can't happen, but if it's more important to you to be with your loved one and transport them and bathe them and build a container, that might be a better place to put your energy than the bureaucratic red tape of paperwork. <laughs> so just an option. But I would suggest if you want to do something which seems outside of the box, have the conversation with all of the authorities, meaning the, I guess, the charge nurse in the hospital or nursing home and say, this is what we want to do. And then if they say, no, 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 it's illegal, you're always welcome to call me. I can always just say I'm a licensed funeral director and I do this and the family has the right to do this. If it helps to have sort of a person of licensure and authority to call on your behalf, more than happy to advocate for you just because it is something the family should be able to do. It's your right. It's your loved one. This might be a good place for me to mention body donation. And sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to be cremated, I'm not going to be buried. I'm giving my body to science. So that is noble. That's fantastic. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. You can donate your eyes to the Lion's Vision Source. Plenty of places are happy to take your tissue. Um, you can have a full body donation someplace. There's a lot of different organizations for that. But after these organizations use the parts of you, your anatomical donation, then most of them provide a complementary cremation. So your form of disposition was the cremation. Um, almost like if you're going to have a funeral or have a visitation, then something needs to happen to your body afterwards. There's a ceremonial part. Maybe there's that piece of what you're going to do for a donation, but something needs to happen with you. People have said, well, but can I go to the hospital and can I have my body donated and can they use my parts for what they want? And then what if I want to have a natural burial? Sure. Their process technically is a cremation. So have the conversation and say the form of disposition I want to have is this. This is the cemetery I'm planning to go to. This is the funeral home I'm planning to help and you can make that happen. And I have a huge Northern flicker outside. I have a wonderful, I made a little garden. I work so much. So I made this garden space outside my window at the funeral parlor. I'm sort of in the country in the middle of nowhere. So it works out fine. And I get such a beautiful variety of birds and Northern flickers for some reason, they're all over the Pacific Northwest. They just started showing up here in my little yard a week ago. <laughs> so it's thrilling for me. First time I saw one, I thought somebody spray painted a bird because it's just all these colors and they're quite beautiful. So I've got one or maybe two that come visit me and it's it's thrilling. So pardon me while I had my little nature break there. <laughs> so any other question anyone has? <laughs> she wanted you to turn your camera around so they can see. Oh, me. yeah. <laughs> I probably will scare him. He's not yeah, so used to me yet. The other ones I can move and things, and I think, oh, it's just that idiot that feeds us. Where when the new ones come, it's just, I'm scary. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Elizabeth. Appreciate it. Oh, looks like we got another question. What What's the rationale for Washington not allowing burial at home? Do those things change? Do those rules change? Why did Oregon allow them? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a really good question. So when I originally, about 18 years ago, had that family that wanted a home burial, I'd never done that before. But I know occasionally you'll see some sort of stone someplace or a marker. And I thought, well, we had the Oregon Trail, didn't we? And people were buried all through the trail. So when I called the land and planning, I asked them that question. I didn't know who to call originally, but family found out that the land and planning of the county or the people, the zoning department make these rules. And what they had told me is, 
uh, states really can make their own choice. And sometimes there's no rhyme or reason because you'll get tiny states that say we can do this. You'll get big states that say we can, others can't. The state of California says you can't bury on private land. The state of Washington says you can't, but Oregon says go crazy. So, you know, it just, it just really depends what it is. What I have found is the more people ask, the more they shall receive. We have a national cemetery here in Portland and guess what? They allow natural burial. You wanna know why? Because about every two months I'd call and say, I have a veteran who would love to have a natural burial at the cemetery. What do you think? And I kept saying, oh, we don't, you know, we don't do that. We don't do that. I kept calling, kept calling. So pretty soon somebody there thought, well, why don't we have a meeting about it? Why don't we ask our higher ups? And now there's natural burial. So it's merely just what people want, people will ultimately get. That's why we don't have plastic bags at stores anymore. Um, that's why we can check out. It's quicker if we can check out our one or two items in our own little scan machine. It's just things change. So there are 40 five states that do allow home burial in some are just in one county but there is a couple of these states Kansas Indiana California Oregon Arkansas um, Washington that say no and it's just the rules it's just the way it's written it got adopted no one challenged it it just is how it is but I have a feeling things will change I mean, there's water cremation now in 22 states. Natural organic reduction is now legal in six states. Sometimes it takes putting it on a bill. Sometimes it takes people getting excited about a policy. It takes people out there getting signatures. It just depends. So the more people ask, the more things change. That's true about most everything. <laughs> yeah, the comment was, that's true about most everything. Yeah, right, right. And some are for good and some are for bad. I mean, it's interesting how our world is so savvy in so many ways and our world has become so quicker and faster and we can do all these things, but our world has almost become a little bit worse. So um, it just depends. But when it comes to taking care of our loved ones, we're really reverting back to what we did 150 years ago. People are realizing, why do I have to buy a space down the road at the cemetery when I own 10 acres? Heck of a good question, isn't it? Where people are saying, why do I have to buy a fancy expensive shroud when I have a perfectly good sheet right here in my closet? Great question. So it's just been families saying, I want to come bathe my person. Why can't I come into the funeral home and wash mom? Just ask. Thank you, Elizabeth. Appreciate You're welcome. you coming and sharing with us. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, let's get back to the clickers. We'll let you get back to watching the flickers. <laughs> oh, thank you. And if anybody has a question they didn't ask or want to, you're always welcome to call me at the funeral home or email me. Even though we're in a different state, I still possibly have knowledge that will help you. So I'm Cornerstone Funeral Services in Boring, Oregon. No one can ever forget the Boring, Oregon. Also, <laughs> consequently, our Northern American Book Bigfoot Center is here in this town. So I'm really proud of that. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Uh, bye now. Bye bye.